morning. Welcome to the Universalist Church in which love is the spirit. We are glad you are here, whether you're here in the sanctuary today or anywhere in the world. I'm not Lisa, I'm Sherry Inglehart Shea, one of your representatives on the Board of Trustees. If you're a visitor, we hope you'll sign our guest book or visit our webpage, www.westhartfordu.org, to learn more. There you can use the contact page to get onto our electronic mailing list. Our electronic communications are the best way for us to stay connected. We look forward to helping you become a part of the Universalist Church. We're in the season of increased respiratory illnesses, so our ushers have masks to share if you need or would prefer one. We encourage everyone to be careful with your health and the health of others. It's an exciting Sunday to welcome Reverend Adam back to the pulpit. And yay! And he has some announcements for us. Good morning, everybody. It's kind of funny that I come back and the first thing I find out is that there are four announcements and I know that you know that I don't love announcements, but these are all important. So um, I want to make you aware if you are not already of the blood drive that is happening tomorrow. Scott McCloy will be happy to talk with you about it. He's going to be here today. Um, <clears throat> Scott, are you in the room yet? I don't see you yet. Okay, so um, when, when uh, he appears, I know he's going to be in Fisk Hall after worship. Um, he's quite tall, and I think we'll probably be talking about the blood drive. There's room for just a few more people, and they could really use the supplies. After worship today, uh, we will have a visitor's coffee in the parlor. Um, normally it is a first Sunday thing, but last first Sunday was very busy, so we're doing it today instead. So I hope to see any of you who are new and have not yet met me in the parlor after worship for some coffee and conversation. Um, my understanding is that we're doing the Super Bowl today, so uh, that's another thing to be paying attention to in Fisk Hall. And finally, uh, for those of you who need to know about OWL, Our Whole Lives, ah, here's Scott. Blood drive, he's wearing red. You cannot miss him. All right, um, so if you are uh, a parent of an OWL student, um, we need to let you know that things will start at 1215 at, uh, at the meeting house at Unita Unitarian Society of Hartford um, for the next session. So please make sure that you are there with everybody on time. Thank you. After worship, we'll have fellowship in Fisk Hall and through Zoom. If you need help finding your way to Fisk Hall for our fellowship hour, any member of the church will be happy to guide you. Just look for someone wearing a Universalist Church name tag. You can find the link for Zoom in your weekly news or the Breeze calendar. If you aren't getting the weekly news, please sign up for it on our website. And now I invite you to take a moment to make your mobile phone silent, turn off your email, put away your keyboards, and settle in for worship.
do have to wonder, at what age break do people no longer know that song? Because I'm guessing there is a point at which people are like, I, that's interesting, why do they enjoy it so much? Fortunately, I'm old enough to know what it is. If you don't, you can ask me after worship. If you happen to have a home chalice, please light yours while we light ours here in the sanctuary. This weekend is the beginning of the Lunar New Year. It is also Black History Month. So I was incredibly pleased to find a quote from Howard Thurman, the great black progressive theologian and minister that suits. In whatever sense this is a new year for you, may the moment find you eager and unafraid, ready to take it by the hand with joy and gratitude. And so we light our chalice in this spirit, eager and unafraid, joyful and grateful, beginning this new time together with hope, with readiness for where we are needed, for all the wonderful possibilities ahead so that we can make them all come true. May it be so. Our opening hymn is number 360 in the gray hymnal. Number 360 called Here, <clears throat> excuse me, Here We Have Gathered. Please rise in body or in spirit as we sing together.
please join me in speaking the words of our affirmation, our covenant. It's printed in the order of service. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. This is our great covenant, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. Please be seated. So my first thought for a time for all ages today was that I wanted everybody to come up and join me on the stairs, and then I remembered something. Some of you have never met me before. <laughs> Some of you have no idea who I am, and I'm tall, and I'm a little weird because I'm wearing a big white robe, and I don't look like everybody else. So for today, I'm going to have you stay right where you are, and I'm going to tell you a story. And hopefully over time, you'll get used to me, and maybe someday we'll have a moment when we're all up here together, and we'll do a little bit of back and forth and do it a little differently. But for today, stay right where you are. In this story, once upon a time, there was a person who came to town. And they tried to set up their house. They arrived in a new place. They didn't know anybody. And they realized that they needed some help. And so this guy was sitting on his front steps, just looking around, like, I don't know what to do. I don't know who to talk to. I don't know how to make any of this happen. And a woman came down the street and smiled at him and said, good morning. I haven't seen you here before. I live two houses down. I'm assuming you're new. Welcome to the neighborhood. Thank you, he said. She wondered why he was sitting there so dejected. And he said, well, I have so much to do. I could really use some help, and I just don't know who to ask. I don't even know what to do. And she said, well, there are lots of folks here with all kinds of skills. And usually people here are pretty willing to help one another out. All you have to do really around here is just be friendly. Talk to them all. I'm sure you will find what you need. And so she went down the street to the corner cafe and sat down at a table to have her morning tea. So he started thinking, okay, what do I need? What do I need? What do I need? I need someone who can help me build some stuff because that Ikea furniture just confuses me. <laughs> and I need somebody who can sing, actually, because they're going to help make our spirits lighter while we do this work with the Ikea furniture. I need somebody who can sew because my curtains got torn in the move and I don't want to hang them looking all ragged and sad. And I could probably use somebody who can cook because I'm going to be running around so much that I, I don't even know if there's going to be a way for me to have dinner tonight. And so as people came up and down the street, he stopped being quite so dejected. And instead, he sat up and he looked at people and he said, Hi, I'm new. And he told them about himself and he told them what he needed and he asked for their help, and no one said yes. Not a single person said yes. And so he went from being all cheerful and happy and sitting upright to being all dejected and sad again. And the woman came back down the street and looked at him and said, why, why do you look so sad again? And he said, well, I needed people to help. And you said that they were friendly, and, and they were, but no one could help. She said, well, so I talked to the folks that were coming past, and they were sad that they couldn't help, but you asked the town's best cook if they could build. And you asked the town's best builder if they could sing, <laughs> and the town's best singer if they could sew, and the town's best tailor if she could cook you would have been so much wiser to ask them what they were good at and to see if they could then share their gifts with you. Sometimes it's good to get to know people instead of forcing them to get to know you first. At which point he realized what his day had been like and that all he really needed to do was get to know people. And so he laughed and he said to her, 
please, tell me about yourself. Who are you? What do you love? What do you do? What are you good at? And it was the start of him making some wonderful friends and building a fantastic community in his new town. And that's the end of this story, but the start of a whole lot of other ones. Let's sing our children and their teachers out to their classes. The words are printed in your order of service. We will keep a place for you wherever you may go. We'll sustain this hope and faith of love you've come to know. Go in peace, bring hope to hearts that yearn. We will keep a place for you till you return. The voluntary offering the sharing of our resources for our shared work as a religious community is a spiritual practice for us. By offering your time and your talent and your treasure to this community, you help us to serve our members, our friends, and the wider community in which we are embedded. So as part of that service, we share our general offering each week with organizations that do work in the world that bring us ever closer to creating the beloved community. And this month, we share our offering with the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee, also known as the UUSC. The UUSC is a nonprofit, non sectarian organization advancing human rights together with an inter international community of grassroots partners and advocates. The UUSC ad advances human rights and social justice around the world with those partners confronting unjust power structures, and mobilizing to counter oppressive policies. Their work is grounded in the idea that all people have inherent power and dignity. To give electronically, you can use QR codes on your order of service, or the links in the description online, or just those on our website to make your donation to our offering. And here in the sanctuary, our offering will now be gratefully received.
May these gifts, so generously given, sustain the work that we do together in the life of this community and also help make wonderful change in the wider world of which we are a part. Thank you. Thank you. Please rise, in body or in spirit, as we, sit, as we speak our congregational reading. It's number 443 in the Gray Hymnal, number 443, called We Arrive Out of Many Singular Rooms. I'll speak the words in Roman type, and together we'll speak the words in italics. We arrive out of many singular rooms, walking over the branching streets. We come to be assured that brothers and sisters surround us to restore their images on our eyes. We enlarge our voices in common speaking and singing. We try again that solitude found in the midst of those who with us seek their hidden reckonings. Our eyes reclaim the remembered faces. Their voices stir the surrounding air. The warmth of their hands assures us and the gladness of our spoken names. This is the reason of cities, of homes, of assemblies and houses of worship. It is good to be with one another. And let's join in singing our doxology. I don't have anything on behalf of the community to share with you this morning in terms of the pastoral prayer. I'm pretty sure that doesn't mean that your lives have been boring, or that nothing has happened, or that some of you couldn't use a little extra support, or some celebration with you. And so I would ask us all to hold the truth that our lives, even if we don't say it out loud, are challenging and joyful are worthy of sharing and sometimes need to be held close to. Let us hold one another and this entire congregation in our hearts. Please take a moment and pray with me. So let us pray for wisdom and mercy compassion and truth-telling, thought and behavior that uplifts rather than diminishes in the minds and hearts and actions of leaders of the nations of this world, that they may find ways to preserve justice and peace without brutality, that they may bring us closer to creating a world that truly is a beloved community. Let us pray for those who are trapped in the midst of conflict. Whether the kinds of conflicts that have shown up in the news, like that in Ukraine, Israel and Gaza, those that we may not be quite as aware of, like Sudan and Congo, even if we've just heard the words, or those numerous conflicts around the world that we are not informed about. Let us pray for the people, especially who are not powerful, who just want safety and peace and food and rest. In all of these situations around the world, let us pray for peaceful and just resolution. 
And let us pray for all of us who can shape the leadership of the future. Those of us who teach, or raise, or counsel. Those of us who vote. That we may have the strength and courage to live our values and bring them into the world. And so let us pray, too, for this congregation, that this may be a place of growth, learning, comfort, and ever-increasing love. That this be a place where service takes root and spreads its branches and leaves into the world far beyond our doors, so that we, too, do our part to make things better for us all. Let us take a moment in stillness for the prayers of our hearts. There are so many things for us to pray about. Out in the world, in our own lives, in our community together, let us hold one another close in our hearts with compassion and kindness and hope for the future. May it be so. Our first reading is from a sermon entitled The Fragile Art of Hospitality by the Reverend Katie Kandarian Morris. I make a habit out of attending high school football games. My son is a coach for our local team. One particular Saturday, it was an away game. I carefully scoped out the scene for the visitor stands. You may still remember from your own school days how the visiting team's bleachers are always the smaller stands. They're not as well built and always seem to look somewhat pathetic. Some, surprisingly then, 
I found that this week our away visitor stands were decorated with bright helium-filled balloons, hundreds of them made into one of those fancy twisted braided frames that completely covered the railings of the visitor stands. They were in our team's colors. In front of our stands, there was a huge butcher block sign painted with our school's name and emblazoned with our team mascot. I looked around. There were no personnel here from our school, none of our leadership folks, not our spirit squad. It became clear that this had been done by the host school. Hospitality is not a last minute decision. It takes preparation, commitment, agreement, and action by all the members of the community. Everyone at that high school I visited behaved with that same attitude. The conduct of the players, the attitude of the coaches, the folks working the snack bar, the custodian charged with picking up the trash, the students welcoming, welcoming us over the loudspeaker, all of them showed genuine conviviality. Organization and energy went into planning and carrying out their welcome. It wasn't about their win-loss record. They were living a mission. Our second reading is from the sermon entitled Called to Hospitality by Star Austin, a UU religious educator from our congregation in Huntington, New York. Hospitality is not just letting the stranger join you, but also about you joining the stranger. A subtle but major difference. How do we join the stranger? How do we go from acceptance to affirmation? This is where curiosity comes in. Greeting the stranger with curiosity means getting to know who they are rather than talking about what, who we are. Often in our communities, we greet people with an, an expectation that we will share with them what Unitarian Universalism is, what our congregation does, maybe even what we do personally in the larger society. This approach to hospitality isn't a bad one. It's the mode of the greeter or the community member being the one to share information. This style of being the one with the information to give is hospitable. It is making space, sharing, and through that sharing, extending an invitation. However, if we adopt curiosity as our approach, we make that subtle shift from letting the stranger join us to joining our stranger. Now our role, while still one of welcome, is about getting to know the new person. What brought you here today? What do you do for fun? Where are you on your sp spiritual journey? All good questions to open a deeper and more meaningful exchange, where space has been made to affirm the gifts this newcomer brings with them into the community. I want to live my life like this, to be radically hospitable, to be firmly footed in the work of the holy, which is common and often broken. I want to be part of a faith that says, come anyway, come in, come sit at the table in your dirty clothes caked with mud. Whoever you are, whatever the circ circumstances of your life, Find welcome here.
good to have you here once again. And by now, some of you were wondering if I remember the last six months the same way you do. <laughs> I wasn't here, I know. I was on sabbatical. But all the same, welcome back. Welcome back into my day-to-day -day life, into my thoughts, into my heart, and into my time in a new and familiar way. Thank you for the notes and the calls and the well wishes and the cake last week and the delightful welcome. I really appreciate your warmth, your gladness at my return. It makes it a joy to come back from this interesting taste of retirement that I got. <laughs> it's still about 20 years off, so, you know, like, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Coming back to indifference would have been difficult. If I'd seen you saying, oh, it's him again. <laughs> Dang. That would have been tough. But coming back to smiles and hugs and the community that we are together makes it a joy to be here again. Just before I left, the Sunday before my sabbatical started, I was talking about how time would pass differently for you and for me during those six months. And there's no doubt that it has. You kept this congregation going. And I was off doing totally different things doing some research and some travel and some writing. And I know that things did not go exactly as any of us expected them to. Truth be told, they never do. But we made it through our own challenges and successes. New possibilities arose and perhaps some unexpected doors closed. New people have come. I see you. I don't know you yet, and that's exciting. And some people moved away. There are going to be people that I discover that are no longer here that I was so used to seeing. I know that some of you are really curious about what I did with my six months, so I'm going to give you the short synopsis. And if you want to talk to me a little bit more about the details of it, I'll be happy to. The first thing I will tell you is I did not quite finish writing my dissertation. I had great hopes. But it turns out that my data from my study was so substantial that I've had to turn it into two results chapters and not just one, which means I have to write an extra chapter, which means it's not entirely done yet. But it's close. The research is closed and I am well on my way. I was asked to write a book chapter by the UUA to help talk about how love exists through the perspective of ecological theology. That's going to be coming out, I think, in April, which is super exciting. I cannot wait to be able to share this book with you and to have you all get a chance to read it. I helped my parents through a couple of health crises. They're both fine. In fact, I think they're actually better now than before it all happened, but it was a little wobbly there for a few minutes. I got to see some friends. I had enough time to bake the Christmas cookies that I love the most. I became an adjunct professor at our seminary in Chicago this spring, so I'm teaching a class there now and possibly into the future. Lots of exciting things, some of them not things I expected, have happened. And so I've been thinking about all of that and what it's like to come back here to you I've been finding myself thinking about things a little differently, which is the point of a sabbatical, after all. I've been thinking about how I pursue personal interests and where I fit things into my life and my schedule. I've been thinking about my own spiritual growth, about the really interesting things I have learned, and then wondering how that will affect our community and our spiritual life together. What am I going to bring that's new to all of you? And so, of course, as you can tell, I've been thinking about hospitality. How do we open ourselves to everyone we encounter? I encountered so many new people on my travels. I tried to limit the amount of people that I dealt with for six months, just because it was kind of nice to have a small little community. But the truth is, I did so much travel 
and I met so many people. And I had to welcome them into my heart while also letting them know who I was. And that brought me to thinking about how we do that here together, too. I want you to reflect on what your last six months have been like. How have you shared yourself with people who have come? How have you received those who have arrived? Whether you're somebody who's been here for 30 or 40 years, or somebody who's literally been here maybe a total of three times thus far. How do we make it possible for people to come into our hearts? How do we make it possible for us to meet them as they are, as they share themselves? I think hospitality, the willingness to be with one another in graciousness and genuine appreciation for one another's whole beings, is truly the foundation for spiritual community and justice-making, and true friendship. Hospitality takes us from warm and wonderful one-on-one -on -one relationships to joyful and vibrant community, to civic and societal engagement that values the worth and dignity and power of every single person. A warm welcome is a blessing. And it's really easy to be anxious about what awaits us as we meet someone again after a time apart, or for the very first time with someone we've never met before. I definitely had some moments this morning of thinking, wow, do I actually remember how to do this? I'm, I'm going to be a little rusty, I think. And there are going to be people who've never seen me before. Like, are they going to think that I'm weird or too casual or too formal? Like, what, what are people going to make of me? When we come into a place for the first time, it can be easy to presume that we're not going to receive much of a welcome. And it can also be easy when we are with people that we've known really well to offer just the bare minimum to one another, especially when we are anxious or uncertain. Hospitality is a spiritual practice. It's not about how anyone else responds or reciprocates, but it's about our willingness and ability to be with whoever we are with. Although it might have been just a high school football game, the welcome that Reverend Kandarian Morris and her fellow fans received changed how they perceived a community and how she spoke about her congregation with hospitality. That one good experience can make a homecoming or a new visit something that travels far beyond that moment. She writes, Hospitality is not a last-minute decision. It takes preparation, commitment, agreement, and action by all members of the community. This school was living a mission. And so then she asks us to contemplate, what is the mission of our faith? This religion of ours is just a little bit complicated. As we honor different paths, it is easy to get off track and not think that we do have a shared mission, but we do. The mission of this faith is to be welcoming and nurturing of spirits to foster respect and compassion for all people and a reverence for the web of all existence. Our mission is hospitality. And so today, I am thinking about taking that hospitality further than the initial welcome back. Welcome back into my heart and so on. And the welcome back that you offer, I want us to take that and move it forward just a little bit. My experience of this congregation, six months ago and well before that, is that we do like welcoming newcomers into our spiritual home. But what I would really love is for all of us to welcome one another, every one another just met or long known, into our hearts and lives. 
That's actually a practical action. It's not just a, a grand thought. It is a practice, a spiritual practice. Think back to that story that I told. What if the homeowner had welcomed people to his doorstop with questions about them as well as his statements about himself? What might he have learned? What relationships might he have built? An essential part of this kind of hospitality is curiosity. A willingness to wonder and ask and hear without presumption or judgment or agenda. Star Austin writes, Greeting the stranger with curiosity means getting to know who they are rather than always talking about who we are. If we adopt curiosity as our approach, we make the subtle shift from letting the stranger join us to our joining the stranger. For some of you, I am the stranger. For some of you who have known me a while, you think you know exactly who I am now that I've come back. And I promise you, you don't. And for me, I think I know so many of you already. But after six months, there's more to learn. We have to be willing to hear about one another's joys and uncertainties, our skills and our needs, our dreams and our limits. So six months ago, I asked you to remember what work belongs to you, the congregation. The minister is only a part of the community. It's easy to look to me and think, hey, that guy, he knows what he's doing, and he's going to make it all happen. But the truth is, I can't. I can't. There are not enough hours in the day or hands on the ends of my arms to do all of the things that need to be done. And so you needed to figure out what is yours to do and how will you do it? And I've been starting to learn about some of that. I've talked with the staff, I've talked with the board, a few people have let me know what's been going on. And I want to know what you have experienced. I said to you that these six months were not just for treading water. There's no such thing as placeholder time. All time is meant to be attended to wisely, used well. And so, coming back, I want to know how you used your time. What did you make happen? At home or here? What did you have to deal with? What opportunities arose for you? Who are you now? Did you put yourself more fully into this community or another community while I was away? Or did you find yourself withdrawing a little bit? Why? What does that tell you that you want or need? I want to know who were you without me? Did you like what you experienced? Were there some things that you didn't like that you need me to know about too? Who have you discovered that you want to become? And so in this way, it is time for us to talk with one another. It is time for us to be deeply hospitable, to be curious about each other, to learn, to take one another into our hearts. It's especially time for you to come talk with me. There are too many of you for me to just show up on all of your doorsteps day after day and say, hi, how you doing? Tell me about life. But if you have something that you want to share with me, I hope that you will at minimum send me an email. Or better yet, make an appointment with me. Let's have some coffee or some tea or some lunch. Let's talk on the phone or over Zoom. Let's find time to get to know each other once again. 
I would like us all to be together in curiosity, learning from one another. This isn't just a thought exercise. It's a real ask. I'm not joking. Make an appointment. I like talking to you. And as much as I had to set you down for six months, the truth is I missed you when you were not in my life every day. And I would like you to be there again. So I'm going to keep asking you. I'm going to keep nudging you to get hold of me, to talk to me, even if it's just in the hallway here. So you might as well get used to it and start thinking about how you can talk back. <laughs> Welcome back into my life. And thank you for welcoming me into yours. I am very excited to get to know you all once again. Please rise, in body or in spirit, as we join in singing our closing hymn. It's number 312 in the gray hymnal. Number 312. Let us join in speaking our unison benediction. It's printed in your order of service in the description online. Engage with the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return to no person evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all beings. Please be seated. We have a little bit of a special uh, postlude here. We have our church school drumming ensemble that is going to perform for us, which I'm very excited about. I cannot wait to hear what you all do. And while they are getting set up, I want to remind you that after worship today, there are a number of things happening. One, talk to Scott McCloy about the blood drive. Two, there's the Super Bowl. Three, there's a visitor's coffee happening in the parlor. Um, I will be back in that space uh, shortly after we end. And there is one more thing to tell you about. At 11.15 in the program center, so the big room directly behind the sanctuary this way, is a welcoming congregation event. Mel and Ace are here to talk about Q+, and LGBTQIA plus youth. 
So please come hear about this organization that we have been incubating within our building to support our queer youth uh, in the greater Hartford area. Okay. Thank you so much for making music for us this morning. We are very grateful. Nicely done, everybody. Thank you. We'll see you in Fisk Hall, or the Program Center, or the Parlor.